and welcome to Night Under Books. We've had a bit of a break, uh, so we're back with our wrap up for March. Um, house stuff is still ongoing, so but we've managed to recreate our old filming location with minimal work, so hopefully it'll look like nothing's changed. So in March then we went on holiday for a week to Europe, uh, travelling around on trains to Belgium and Holland, which did allow us quite a bit of reading but then I admit I haven't read anything since that two weeks ago. Unfortunately it also exposed us to a few new bookshops so there was a little bit of uh, book purchasing as well, um, yes. which I'm sure will come up in a later video. This also means that we were trying to limit the amount of luggage we took with us, so more than usual the books that we've read are the same. <laughs> so first book is Binti the Night Masquerade by Nnedi Okorafor. Um, this concludes the trilogy of Binti novellas slash novels and this is a satisfying conclusion to uh, the story of Binti. She very much comes into her power and makes her presence felt, though it doesn't go quite as well as she might have anticipated. The first one I'm going to talk about is Njar. How I became the mayor of a large city in Iceland and changed the world by John Njar large city here meaning Reykjavik which is about 150,000 people. Yeah it's large for Iceland. So this is a non-fiction uh, book which I quite enjoyed so it's uh, it's got a little bit of politics, a little bit of what it's like to be Icelandic. Um, John was a comedian before he became mayor um, and he led quite a controversial newly formed party called the Best Party, which is quite fun to learn about and I definitely feel better informed and he talks about some interesting political ideas as well. I didn't find it as funny as I was expecting though given his background and the chapters are very short, um, which was great in that I felt like I was whooshing through it but it never quite got into the depth I was looking for. So I rated this three and a half stars. So I'm glad I read it, um, but it's quite expensive for a very small book. So this is The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, which is quite literally a whistle-stop tour of the different forms that racism can take during an alternate history of uh, America, where the Underground Railroad, the um, system of uh, moving escaped slaves further north, is sort of reified. There is a real railroad. As you might imagine, this isn't the most comfortable read, but it's certainly thought-provoking and uh, visceral without being uh, deliberately uh, sort of shocking. There's not actually as much violence as you might expect sort of on screen. Um, it's more about um, what the threat and expectation of violence does to the protagonist and the people around her. I also started this um, this month, but I'm only about a third through at the moment. It turns out that with Brexit and uncertainty of house move, it wasn't quite the comforting read that I was looking for, but yeah, should hopefully finish that next month. My next one is another non-fiction book. This one that we took on holiday because it was one that we both wanted to read and thought might be quite light. And we don't for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, so this is You're Never Weird on the Internet Almost by Felicia Day. Uh, Felicia Day is pretty famous, uh, certainly in some circles. Queen of the Geeks um, is a name she's been given. She's an actress and also is a producer and has acted in various kind of online um, like web series. Web series. This being her biography, you get to learn a little more about all of that, which I found quite interesting, especially the web series stuff, because it does kind of, did remind me of having a YouTube channel, funnily enough. Um, Although I am glad that we're not trying to create sets quite as complicated. <laughs> she has a brilliant voice um, to read. It's very emphatic, um, very excitable. It was absolutely her that I was reading it. I could hear her voice. Mm -hmm. um, I found it incredibly quick to read. Uh, lots of laugh out loud moments, but it does also kind of delve into some of the kind of more serious things so like mental health and online bullying. There is a chapter in about uh, Gamergate. Um, 
But going back to the sort of voice of it, um, it's the first book I've seen that almost feels a bit like a Tumblr post where you'll get to, you know, a point where she wants to make a point and there will be a still image with like macro text over it, which um, kind of lends to that kind of very chatty tone. Yeah, so I, I rated this four stars, um, so I really enjoyed it. Yep, yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, so I think if you're a fan of her, then it's definitely worth picking up. Um, but even if you're not, you might be able to find things in it that you'd enjoy. Next up is Mecha Samurai Empire by Peter Tirias, uh, which I think I picked up for free at an SFX event. Um, and I'm really glad I did, actually. It was really good fun. It's set in an alternate, slightly sort of mad science uh, timeline where the Allies lost the war. Um, and America has been divided between Germany and Japan um, and they've devolved into a state of cold war with a, uh, a demilitarized zone in between the two which is patrolled on the Nazi side by a uh, giant biomecha um, and on the Japanese side by giant mech samurai because why not? It reminds me a little bit of, say, something like uh, Ready Player One, in that you follow kind of a no-hoper as he regularly gets thrown into the fire and keeps on kind of refining himself and eventually realising that he's actually quite good at this stuff, but he has to put the work in. It was very silly, but uh, with some interesting stuff um, underneath that and some uh, interesting conversations about what it means to be loyal and who you should be loyal to. It, it's done the job of a freebie. I will be picking up more in this, I think. My next one is the next Murderbot book uh, by Martha Wells. It's Artificial Condition. We picked this up because while we were on holiday, we had to submit our Hugo nominations and I thought this one might be worth reading to see if we wanted to nominate, which well, I think I did. I didn't like it quite as much as the first one. I think it kind of lost a bit of the, the freshness and the mm. kind of surprise but it is still Murderbot. I really enjoyed seeing that character again, uh, kicking ass, meeting a new group of people, found families. Um, there's one new character that I really enjoyed, a spaceship. Who's that... a complete dick. Yeah, yeah, but you don't often see that, so that was fun. Um, but they're quite short, so um, I suppose it couldn't quite get into those relationships as much as I'd have liked. But, but there's going to be a novel soon. Yes, true. So, yeah, I rated it four stars. Um, I will definitely be continuing with the series, although whether I'll be keeping up with them at their hardback prices, who knows. I also read Artificial Condition. Murderbot continues to be an unusual and interesting protagonist to read. Next up is The Invisible Library by Genevieve Cogman. This follows a um, librarian uh, from a secret library at the centre of the universe, which um, seeks to collect books from alternate timelines and alternate realities. Um, she is sent to a universe where chaos has made a dangerous toehold. And the thing about chaos inf infected universes is that they follow stories rather than physics. It's a fun, silly romp, honestly, and with politics continuing to be a dumpster fire, occasionally that's what you need. Also, if the love triangle in this doesn't turn, doesn't resolve in a poly way, I'm going to be really annoyed. Again, I'm destined to be annoyed about that forever, but... My last one is another one which we read in the hopes that it might be a Hugo nomination for us, and it definitely was. This is The Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Coyle, which is the first in a duology. I absolutely love this book. I could not fault it. Um, that's a, that's a 4.75 stars. Because your rating doesn't really go up to 5. Well, I suppose there could be something. Maybe I like the second one better. How would I account for that? So, this is a alternate universe story uh, set in the 50s and 60s, um, but where a giant meteor hits Washington DC in a pretty dramatic way, and one that is not going to be great for the future of humankind. Which means that this space programme is rapidly accelerated. 
or needs to be, trying to persuade the public that that's where the money should be going is just a whole interesting thing that's going on in this book, which I really enjoy as an analogy to climate change. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's an aside. Uh, the main character in this is a married woman who seems very flawed but very real. I found her extremely relatable and she is the one really trying to get, uh, among a group of other women, women a place on this space program. This does also not shy away from the fact that black people were not included in the space program. Um, the main character is white um, but she does have many friends in the story that are black and she makes some mistakes and learns from them and makes some assumptions so it, it felt quite genuine. Mm. Likewise she's Jewish and everybody assumes that she's a recent immigrant from the war. Mm. It's like, no, actually my family's been here for hundreds of years um, and she keeps on being offered like cheese and ham sandwiches. Yes, just, just really good. Yeah. You've got effectively two sources of tension because you've got the will women ever be allowed into space sort of combat or fight that she's going through and then also you've got the are they ever going to get enough people off the planet um, as a kind of separate source of tension mm. and um, it also showcases what I'm beginning to think of as Mary Robert Carl's kind of signature which is an established supportive marriage um, and I'm not sure quite how typical of the time it is I suspect not very but it, it's it's a nice relationship mm. to see inside of um, I've seen some comments saying that um, actually the uh, protagonist is very passive aggressive. I've... We're British. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just found it relatable. <laughs> oh, there is so much more I could say about this book. Um, the, the character's anxiety was really interesting as well. Yeah. Um, I think I will just leave it there though and say that I am so excited to pick up the next one and we'll have to find it somewhere as soon as possible before I forget anything about this one. One thing I would say, we were just talking about this morning, is that I think it's interesting that it's been published very much as a genre book. Um, honestly, I think if this had gone out from a mainstream publisher and been published as alt historical, I think this would have found a much wider audience. So, you know, if you've got it and like it, lend it to relatives who don't read genre, because there's really nothing explicitly SF or fantastical about this. That's true. We will be, uh, now that we've both read it, lending it out to as many people as we can. Finally, Mass Effect Andromeda Annihilation by Kat Valenti, which is a tie-in to a, uh, one of my favourite video game universes. Basically takes up where the game left off, because the game didn't get very good reception, and um, a proposed bit of downloadable content was canned. Um, which was really sad because that featured all of my favourite races from that universe. Actually, I can live with that now. The uh, canning of the DLC means I get this book. I am more than happy. This is set on a colony ship um, on which the vast majority of people are frozen and it has been sent to another galaxy to escape a threat in our home galaxy. Um, there are no humans on board. There are, however, a boatload of characters on board. A sleepwalker crew is woken up because something is wrong. People are dying whilst asleep. They're off course. They have no idea why and the computer's having a panic attack. It's, it's a whole raft of fun. It really is. Um, the alien races are incredibly well drawn and realised, um, including Races with perfect recall, so you get to see bits of their past. Races that don't use personal pronouns, because that would be um, presumptuous. They do, however, belong to a doomsday cult, so uh, the fact that everybody's dying actually fills them with glee! And a race who speak in a completely monotone voice so they have to clarify the emotion they're wishing to convey at the start of every sentence. Um, Excited. Um, or despairing. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of despairing. Yeah, just, just fun. So much fun. 
Should I read it, having not played the game? Um, you don't have to have played Andromeda. Um, I would say if anybody who's played even probably the first two Mass Effect games would know enough to get along with this. I honestly don't know. I'd be interested to see a review by somebody who's not played the games. Okay, so those were all the books that we read in March, which is an okay number for me, a ridiculous number for you, seeing as you'd read all the books that I read as well as yours. Hopefully once the house move progresses a bit, then we'll get back into the world of reading. We don't get too distracted by video games. Let us know if you've read any of these and what your thoughts were. Our reading for the next few months um, might be trying to fit in more of the Hugo uh, finalists um, just so that when it comes to voting then we've got a little more to go on. Oh, I've read a terrifying proportion of the novels and novellas already. We're at a good start. Thank you for watching, we'll see you again soon.